Thank you for the introduction. Um, okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm from University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur. My name is Rauda. And I'll be talking about um, the Peace Initiative, addressing elder abuse and neglect using an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, well, if we look at the uh, theme of our conference today, it's an uh, interdisciplinary approach and collaboration um, for health for all. So um, leveraging these two terms, interdisciplinary approach and collaboration, so um, perhaps I, would, I should make it clear from the beginning that I'm not going to present a specific study, nor am I going to talk about uh, certain types of results or statistical analysis, but what I'm going to touch on today is basically uh, to share um, one of our experiences that we have in the University of Malaya in which we um, approach uh, a health problem or a health issue using uh, a multidisciplinary approach. Okay, so um, don't worry so much about the slides. My slides are rather simple, uh, but I'll try my best to explain them. Uh, so EAN stands for Elder Abuse and Neglect. Um, I'm sh quite sure most of you have heard of the, the problem. Um, so the uh, issue of elder abuse um, actually falls under the domain of family violence. Now when I talk about family violence, there are, main, there are three main types of family violence. The first one is child abuse, okay, that, that's quite I mean, I'm quite sure you're familiar with it. And then we've got domestic violence, or some people say it IPV, the intimate partner violence, okay. And the youngest of all uh, area is elder abuse. So um, not uh, many studies, uh, or I would say not much research has been done to actually understand this issue. And research, or um, well, systematic investigation into this issue started actually quite late. Um, it started mainly in, the, in North America, and then it moved uh, to Europe. But in the middle and lower income countries, uh, it's still, uh, we, we don't have much information or knowledge about it. Okay, so that's the definition by WHO. Um, a single repeated act or lack of appropriate action occurring within any relationship where there is an expectation of trust. Now the word trust there is very important because that defines the, the dynamic of relationship or the dynamic of, of the, the problem, uh, which causes harm or distress to an older person. Now the main, uh, the, the main subtypes of abuse, there are five types, physical, psychological, financial, sexual neglect. If you go through the, the existing literature, you will see that um, the actual types are not confined to these five types, there are more, okay? But these are the uh, most widely used subtypes in, in contemporary studies. Now, worldwide prevalence. Um, uh, the latest systematic review, which has been published in The Lancet last year, said that um, the, the global pooled prevalence of elder abuse is 15.7. Now, now, that's a big number. Okay, so the Malaysian data, we, we just published one paper a um, couple of months back. Uh, we found that uh, the lifetime a EAN prevalence, and what I mean by lifetime is that any abuse episode that happens when an individual turns 60. Okay, so uh, we got a prevalence of 8.1%, okay, but the problem was our study included only cognitively intact, healthy population, uh, community dwelling older adults. That means we excluded those who have cognitive impairment and we excluded those who are very, very sick. For example, those who are bedridden because we, we did not have the, you know, the resources and the, the right um, uh, preparation to, to interview these people, so we couldn't do it. So this 8.1 person is definitely an underestimate. So we um, believe that the prevalence of elder abuse in Malaysia is much higher than that. Okay? And there are studies, uh, actually not one, but a number of studies which say that for every one case of abuse, there are five unreported cases. Okay, so the actual magnitude must be much higher. Um, now, another interesting thing that we found was that um, from this systematic review um, that uh, reported this 15.7% prevalence, it says that the most common subtype is psychological abuse, but Malaysian data shows that the most common subtype is financial abuse, it's 5% out of this 8.1%. Um, the second one is psychological abuse. So I'll be talking a bit more about that later. Okay, so um, in order to understand uh, abuse, first of all, of course, we look at the causes, the etiology. And since uh, elder abuse is quite a new um, field, I would say, 
um, relative to the other two domains, which is uh, IPV, intimate partner violence and child abuse. So most of the theories attempting to explain abuse come from the literature of child abuse and domestic violence. Now, if you go through the, the, the studies which try to explain why abuse occurs, you will find many theories, uh, many, many actually of them, but uh, the most, um, one of the most uh, commonly used one and the, mo the one that we like most, I mean our team like most, is the ecological approach, the ecological model, okay? And this model emphasizes um, the, the fact that uh, abuse is not a, a unidimensional problem, it is a multidimensional issue, it's very complicated, and in order for you to understand it, you can't just look at the individual, you can't just look at the abuser, but you have to look at um, you have to include uh, the, the characteristics of society and also the bigger system in which the individuals are living. Right, so this, uh, this is the ecological model, okay? So you can see that um, uh, this is the individual and then they are, you know, the, the, there's a family influence, the peers, and then what happens around them, you know, the immediate environment, the society in which they're living, and then the bigger system, the culture, the legal system, uh, the socioeconomic, and, and so on and so forth. Right, so um, if you look at uh, existing evidence at the moment, okay, so um, uh, the list of studies is very long, so I can't show you every single thing, but I'll just focus on these three studies. Just for example, uh, two are systematic reviews, and the one in the middle is uh, an, uh, an original study. So you will see that, um, what I want to focus is just this, the, the third column. You can see that uh, most studies which look at um, how to intervene or modes of intervention in cases of abuse, all of them seem to agree that if you want to intervene and if you want to do something with the problem, you need to target all these levels. You have to target the individual level, you have to talk to the family as well, you have to include community, and you have to include somehow um, the institutions probably, you have to talk about the healthcare system, you have to talk about the legal system. So it is a huge problem and uh, of course, research alone at the individual level may not be able to solve the problem. Okay, so um, this is what I, I actually want to share uh, with you about uh, the PEACE initiative, and it stands for Prevent Elder Abuse and Neglect. This is a project that has been started um, uh, from 2014. It's about three years now, it's still quite young. Uh, it was started in the University of Malaya, okay? Um, it was in conjunction with two national policies uh, on older adults, and this is what uh, the program is all about. It's a five-package program aiming at advancing elder abuse research and services through a coordinated multi-step approach involving various stakeholders. So these are the five objectives. Okay? Uh, you can see that the first one focuses on research, because we think that research uh, is, is, you know, it can't solve everything. Research is part of it. But I'll talk about my role later. My role is mainly here. I'm, I'm a PhD student, so this is what I do. Okay, but the whole team is, is much bigger than that. Okay, so we've got uh, people working, uh, you know, giving education training. Um, people working with caregivers. We've got lawyers with us trying to push for a new act in the country, uh, and so on. Okay, um, uh, this is the scary uh, diagram. Um, yeah, it's, it's very complicated and um, you don't have to worry about it. This is basically just a logic model uh, to show um, the overall view, or maybe I can say the helicopter view of the project, okay? Don't worry about it, it's just, um, just to show that, okay, we've got process. What are the outcomes? Short-term, intermediate, and long-term outcomes. And uh, I'll focus mostly on the processes, like what we are doing, what we plan to do in the future. So this is our approach. Uh, it's a, it's a transdisciplinary, or I would say interdisciplinary approach. Um, wait. So these are the, the, the uh, stakeholders that we think uh, are important. Um, well, it's not actually a plan. We have reached out to these people. We are working with them, and we have got uh, quite a number of achievements, which I will share with you afterwards. First of all, we reach out to the, to the individuals, the victims, <coughs> of course, because when we, you want to solve a problem, you have to first uh, focus on who will most benefit from your research findings. Um, and then we approach the caregivers and the family members because uh, when you talk about abuse, uh, there is a victim and there is a perpetrator. So you have to include both and you have to take into account the perspectives, uh, pers perspectives of both parties. And then we go to community. 
Okay. Of course, uh, when we, you talk about community, you will have to um, think about the, the mentality, the, the, the values, the ideology. How does community view the problem? Do they care? Do they want to talk about it? Do, or do they just you know, like dismiss it? Uh, do they hold any uh, uh, ageist attitude, for example? I've actually come across many people who, are, who have some sort of prejudice against the old people. So uh, that's what we addressed at the community level. And then healthcare providers, uh, this is very interesting and very important, uh, we found that, um, we've, we've done quite a number of interviews with doctors and nurses, and we found that many of primary care physicians in Malaysia either don't know anything at all about elder abuse, some of them know something, but don't want to interfere, don't want to talk about it, because they feel like, look, I'm a doctor, you know, what, what do I have to do with this? I, they don't see their role in this problem. And some of them, know about the problem, have come across some cases, but they don't know what's the next step. Because uh, I would say that in our medical curriculum, this issue is not really discussed. Uh, not many doctors are trained to, uh, to, you know, to understand and um, take action when they see these kind of problems. And finally, policy makers, because I'll be talking more about that shortly. Right, um, so these are some of the, um, uh, well, I would say achievements, but yeah. Uh, some of the activities of what we have been doing and what we have done. So uh, as I said before, if you look at the ecological model, you have to uh, target, when you want to solve a problem, you need to work uh, at multiple levels. It can't just be at one level. Uh, and since this problem is, is a complicated one, so we thought that uh, we have to work you know, at, at all these um, levels. The first one is individual. Um, but bear in mind that this is not uh, like we are doing one after another. All of these are actually moving together from 2014. Okay? So the first one, at the individual level, this is where we focus uh, on research. So we've, got, we've started in 2014 and in November 2014, we have um, uh, interviewed um, around 2,000 um, uh, older adults, aged 60 and above, that's our cutoff. Um, in rural Malaysia, so we've, we have got prevalence, we have got risk factors of elder abuse, and there are some intervention studies going on, we're still waiting for the results. Um, at the family level, what we do is, we provide a training and support for caregivers. Now there are two types of caregivers, the first one is formal, the second one is informal. Formal caregivers means those who are paid, but probably like uh, domestic workers, or those who work in home care institutions. Uh, when you talk about informal caregivers, these are family members who are not paid. Okay, for example, you have an older mother and you take care of that person, so you are the informal caregiver. Uh, now, one interesting thing I should highlight here is that when abuse happens, um, what we found that um, in many cases, the abuse happens unintentionally. Okay, so abuse is not always intentional. The abuser does not um, always uh, emotionally neglect, for example, the, the old parent because he or she wants to. Okay, but there are varying factors. I mean, like, uh, there are many underlying factors. For example, they are probably stressed out. They have their own families. They have their own children to take care of. They don't have enough money. They don't have the skills to look after an older person. So all this play a role. And we, we have, we, I mean, we decided that the best way to approach this is not by punishing the abusers. Well, of course, there, there are times when you can punish, but not always punitive approach, but to support them. So that's what we did. We sort of, um, well, it's not easy, of course, the process was long and challenging, but we, we managed to sit down with uh, some people, uh, approach some caregivers, and then you know um, talk to them, what is your problem, and then we provide some uh, sort of training. We got them to sit together, create a support group for them, so that they feel supported and they, they know that uh, if they are in a difficult situation, they are not alone. There are other people you know, who, who, are, who have the same experience. Now at the community level, as I said, uh, we have organized quite a number of awareness campaigns. Uh, in fact, every year at the University of Malaya, we, uh, we organize, um, we call it World Elder Abuse Awareness Campaign. We've got that, I think, I can't remember, but it's around in July, I think every year we have that. We have also organized a number of public forums and seminars. I'll, sh I'll be showing the pictures shortly. Um, the problems at the community level that we have found is, as I said before, many people, um, in the first place, they're not willing to even talk about it because there's a lot of stigma. When you talk about abuse, there's a lot of embarrassment, there's a lot of shame, there's a lot of anger, and many people tend to sort of just 
uh, push the problem under the carpet, okay, uh, either they just deny it or they just say, well, it's just a private matter, you know, I don't want to talk about other people's family affairs and, and uh, that kind of excuse that we have. Uh, so we, we try to create um, a public platform for dialogue to, to encourage people and let them know that, look, it's okay to talk about it. We need to be honest. Okay, there's nothing wrong. Okay, we just have to be open and transparent. So that's what we're trying to tell the public. Okay, I'm not sure how, how effective we've been, but that's what uh, we have been uh, saying again and again in, in our awareness campaigns and public forums. Uh, moving, moving on to the next level, the system. Now, this is, of course, a, a bit more complicated because it's, it's huge and um, it's difficult to evaluate how effective we've been. But uh, first of all, um, refining laws, we are working with lawyers a group of lawyers who also have uh, a similar passion, who care about older people, and we're trying to push for a new law. Um, I'll be talking about uh, a bit about acts and laws after this. Um, the next thing we do is we are training, we have been training doctors and nurses. We focus more on primary care physicians because I think these are usually the, the first group of doctors that patients come to before they uh, access a higher level of care. Uh, we found that many doctors actually do not know how to, they don't have the skills to detect abuse. So we, we, we have been training them and I've been, uh, I was involved in training some of the primary care doctors in one of the Malaysian states in the Penang Island and we found that they actually really appreciate it and they told us that sometimes they are not able to uh, detect and sometimes they can, they feel suspicious, like they, they, there is suspicion but they don't know how to proceed from there. Okay, and whether it is appropriate to ask further questions and to take action. So that's how that's where we guide them. And then um, we engage with social workers as well. Okay, we got the social workers to sit with the doctors because um, uh, the mechanism is that when the doctors uh, detect some sort of abuse, they're supposed to uh, liaise with social workers and the social workers will take it from there to the next level. So uh, of course, many social workers they, they are aware, of course, because they're social workers, but they don't know um, how, how do they get information from doctors. So because they have, they have uh, no one has really, you know, made them communicate <coughs> with each other. So we are sort of like the middle person, you know, gathering people together and let them, make them talk. Uh, okay, so these are just, uh, this is just a uh, repetition. It's actually some of the activities. It's just a different way of classification. Um, um, community engagement, as I mentioned, okay, these are the same thing. Uh, another one that I have not mentioned is engagement with media. So we work with journalists and um, uh, newspaper editors, some local magazines. We work with radio DJs. We work with um, people in the television, okay, because we want everyone to hear what we want to say to society. Uh, we've got some um, yeah, uh, cohort studies and prevalence studies, uh, cross-sectional, um, some already published and some ongoing. Uh, we also provide uh, training modules for caregivers and guidelines for clinicians. Guidelines for clinicians, what I mean by that um, is that when they detect case of abuse, so what to do next? Now this is some pictures, okay, so um, this one. Uh, well, actually, the, the, the whole slide uh, is showing you some of the uh, training programs that we have for nurses. Okay, this uh, and this happens mainly in uh, clinics in rural areas. At the moment, we are actually focusing on rural areas first because we think the older adults there are more um, sort of underserved and more marginalized as compared to those in the urban area. Okay, these are um, more pictures. So training, okay, this one is training for caregivers, okay, so a group of caregivers, formal and informal, we sit with them, uh, support them, uh, teach them some skills, okay, um, probably uh, teach them how to manage stress, okay, if they feel angry, how to manage that. And then this is uh, training of trainers, so we identify a number of individuals who we think are able to train others, okay. So we train them so that this problem, um, I mean, later, if this project stops, at least there is some sort of sustainability because other, other people can, can continue it. Oh yeah, this is World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Oh, sorry, it's not July, it's June. Okay, 15 of June. So uh, these are some of the campaigns that we had. Uh, some of the newspaper articles that we've written. This is a program that we have with older adults, okay? As we. From time to time, we have regular um, you know, physical activity with them. Okay, we go to 
um, the residential areas. We invite the older adults you know, to, to come, just come up from the house and mix with each other. Because as you know, one of the uh, risk factors of abuse is social isolation and low social support. This, is, this has been proven by previous studies. So by getting them to talk to each other, by creating some sort of social support and social capital for them, this can actually um, help them uh, help reduce the risk of being abused. Okay, so yeah, uh, we've written quite a number of, uh, we've made a lot of noise actually in the local media, and we are part of that. Uh, we've written to um, different newspapers, uh, including the Chinese newspaper, that's my supervisor, uh, although I don't understand anything here, but yeah, that's, I believe they translate what we say. <laughs> and we've got a, a YouTube video as well, I, I can't play it now, but I have the link later if you're interested. Okay, so what we're doing now, uh, I, I promised you I would talk a bit about the Act. At the moment in Malaysia, we have one Act, which is called the DVA 1994, and that is the Domestic Violence Act. So um, um, we are not very happy with it. <laughs> I mean, we, the, 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 the advocates for uh, older people, because we think that it's not enough. When it was first designed, it was mainly designed for abuse of uh, partners. You know, for, for cases in, uh, in which wives are abused, mainly physical <coughs> abuse. So we don't think it's specific enough. And many lawyers are saying the same thing, actually. We have talked to local lawyers and they say that no DVA is not enough. We need a specific act to protect older people, older Malaysians from abuse. We have got Child, uh, Child Abuse Act. We have got Domestic Violence Act. So why can't we have an act for older people? So uh, we are working at the moment with uh, lawyers, with social workers, and also with uh, quite high-level policymakers. It's still um, being discussed. It's not there yet, but we're pushing for it. Future initiatives. So um, just a short plan of what we're going to do in the future. Um, we found that financial abuse is the most common. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, we, we feel that it's important uh, for us to delve further into this uh, specific subtype to look at the risk factors uh, and what kind of intervention can actually work. Uh, there is some data on this, uh, but m most of the studies in this area has been, have been done in uh, the Western countries, I think in the uh, in the more higher income context, but for, for Malaysia, you know, it could be very much different, so we need our own data. So my role, um, I'm mainly a researcher. I'm doing a PhD, and um, that's what I do. I did a collection analysis, publication, dissemination. Um, I have published about four papers, and um, I help in advocacy as well. I do radio interviews, and I write to newspapers, and of course, networking and training. Um, I present conferences, and uh, I train primary care doctors and nurses mainly on uh, how to detect abuse, like what are the signs and symptoms. Uh, and also, I, uh, I'm involved in um, giving them guidelines. That means um, uh, letting them know what to do if you detect an abuse case, uh, in, especially in the clinical setting. Okay, so, okay. so um, to sum up, sum up my presentation, okay. So um, basically, it's, um, I would say that uh, it's all about knowledge translation. So when we talk about knowledge translation, uh, well, the first step is always that you identify a problem and then you try to solve it. So it's not enough for us just to identify a problem and generate some evidence, some knowledge. Okay. Uh, well, of course, it's good. It's good that we have evidence. It's good to publish, but we are not supposed to stop there, and we need to take the step one step further. That is to make sure that something's being done about it. So uh, I think that's the whole uh, point uh, of what our, our team is doing. Um, we, we, are, we have created some research evidence now. We have the knowledge, though not complete, perhaps, uh, but we, we don't think we have to wait, so we just jump directly to how to translate it, and that's why we um, create these multidisciplinary teams, as I have mentioned to you before, and we try to move forward from there. Right, um, so these are just some of the lessons that we learned uh, through the interdisciplinary collaboration. We've got knowledge sharing, new ideas, uh, far-reaching outcomes, and also a lot of challenges. Uh, maybe I just uh, should make one last point that when you work in a multidisciplinary uh, team, uh, it's not always uh, easy or smooth, even though, yes, you will achieve more in the end, but there are a lot of challenges because when we sit with people with different backgrounds, um, 
they've got different experiences and they've got different perspectives, especially when you talk to policymakers and politicians, for example, we need to understand their perspective and we need to understand what is it that, what are their concerns. It may not always be similar to what we think as researchers. Okay, well, that's the first lesson. Um, if you want to go alone, uh, go, if, you, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Uh, it's acknowledgement. Thank you uh, to um, our funders, University of Malaya, Julius Center, uh, JCUM, uh, the Kyoto Global Conference organizer, just on time, okay, and Population Studies Unit. So yeah, um, any questions?